Good morning, everybody. The the reading is Luke 18, and I'm reading from verse 9, and it's on 1052. The parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. To some of you who are confident in their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went out, went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like the tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would, not, he would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For anyone who exalts himself, it will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be justified. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, we do thank you for your holy word, and we pray, Lord, that you will bless our sister Helen as she brings the sermon today. Lord, we ask that you will guide her thinking, and if there's anything extra that you want to say to us that she hasn't thought of or prepared, Lord, that you will burn it into her heart. Lord, that it will be something that she can't keep in. We pray, Lord, that you'll anoint her, that her, this word will be your living word for us. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Um, being asked to speak in a service for me is a bit of a two-edged sword. On the one hand, I find it really exciting to study God's word and to discover something new trying to listen to what he wants me to say. I enjoy the preparation. I enjoy looking at commentaries and putting together something that is hopefully comprehensible and and useful. On the other hand, I absolutely hate it. It's a real struggle to study God's word, to try to listen to what he wants me to say, to find time to do the preparation, to look at the commentaries, and try to put together something that is vaguely comprehensible and useful. But worst of all, I normally find that it challenges me. My attitudes, my preconceptions, my walk with God. It can be really uncomfortable. And that is certainly the case with this passage. So if what I say this morning makes you feel a bit uncomfortable, then you're not alone. And perhaps have a cup of tea together afterwards and try to encourage each other. So let's look at God's word together. Just a reminder that Jesus is talking uh, in parables and their stories, which are designed to make a point. They contain truth, but they're not necessarily a true happening. That's just a reminder. And this passage is immediately preceded by another parable that Jesus is telling his disciples, and Lynn looked at this last week, the parable about not giving up in prayer. And today's reading follows the same theme of prayer, but with a twist. The passage follows straight on from the previous parable when Jesus is talking to his disciples And that's not necessarily just the 12, that's probably a a much bigger group than than just his 12. Jesus tells the story of two people representing two groups of people that those listening would have been all too familiar with. I'm going to spend a bit of time just looking at who they were. First, there was the Pharisee. You might not know, but Pharisees were a group of religious leaders. The group was formed about 300 years before Jesus was born, Interestingly, at a time when God's voice was silent. They were distinguished by their strict observance of the traditional and written law, and they considered themselves to be more holy than everyone else, and they kept themselves separate. They were a most respected and honored group. Their intent was to try to help the Jews keep God's laws and the Jewish traditions, but it's often the case when it's a man's good idea rather than God's, they went off track and placed huge burdens on the people. Some of them were priests, 
but not all. And they hated Jesus. The other person in the story is a tax collector. Now, I've had some dealings with a tax man and always have found those working from HMLC very pleasant and helpful when I've had to deal with them, when I could eventually get through to speak to them. But that was not the view of tax collectors in Jesus' day. The Jewish people have been under oppression ever since they were exiled to Babylon. And during the time of this story, the New Testament times, the land of Israel was under Roman occupation and the tax collectors were collectors of Roman taxes. They were extortioners and they were despised and detested by the Jews, not only because of their abusive attitudes, but because they represented the oppression of Rome and were a constant reminder that God had forsaken his people because of their disobedience. And in those days, society lumped tax, tax collectors together with prostitutes, gamblers, thieves, crooked money lenders, and others who lived promiscuous and lawless lives. And I read that common nicknames of the day for tax collectors were licensed robbers and beasts in human shape. Nice. According to Jewish teaching, there was no hope for a tax collector. They were excluded from all religious fellowship, including the temple and synagogue. Their money was considered tainted and it defiled anyone who accepted it. So that's the history behind it, but it's important to understand that background in order to see what God might be saying to us. So let's go back to the passage, and here comes the first uncomfortable bit. In the preceding passage, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he continues by saying in verse 9, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. And when we read God's word, especially the words of Jesus, we need to ask if Jesus could possibly be speaking to us. In this passage, he is speaking to his disciples, not unbelievers and not the Pharisees. And he says, to some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. If you're like me, then that verse should make you sit up and take note. Could Jesus possibly be speaking to me? Let's move on. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. And we're often encouraged to bring our prayers with thanks, and so far so good. But just look at what he's saying. He's really saying, God, I thank you that I'm so wonderful. In the commentary I was reading, it said, God needs to do nothing for him. He makes no request of God. He offers no honor to God. This religious man has done it all. After reading his prayer, we wonder whether God should apply to be his assistant. In contrast, the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And it's quite clear from the story that Jesus wanted his listeners to know that there was a goodie and a baddie in the tale. Think cops and robbers, Tom and Jerry, Bond and Blofeld, Batman and the Joker. We all know how the stories go. And to those who are listening, the story would have all initially sounded okay. It was a natural order of things. In their minds, the Jewish religious leader was the goodie and the tax collector was the baddie. But as usual, Jesus turns things upside down, and they really shouldn't have been surprised, should they? It's what Jesus did all the time. Think about the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor. That was against their cultural norm. The meek shall inherit the earth. Think about the woman at the well. The rich man and Lazarus that Glyn talked about a couple of weeks ago. Think about Jesus himself, a king born in a stable. He turned the normal way of things on their heads. In this parable, Jesus quite clearly means us to understand who the goody and the baddie were. And it went right against the cultural norm. And it's hard for us today to understand just how shocking this would have been to his listeners. For it was the utterly despised tax collector who was the goody, who found favor with God and went home justified. That is righteous in God's eyes, rather than the keeper of the religious laws who relied on his own righteousness. The Pharisee already thought that he'd done enough to find favor with God. He tithed appropriately, he prayed regularly, and he fasted twice a week. 
There's absolutely nothing wrong with these things as far as they go, is there? We're supposed to give our money, our time, and our skills to God's work. Of course we should pray regularly. And it may be that you find fasting helpful or God calls you to fast. The problem with the Pharisee was that he didn't recognize his sin and he saw no need of repentance or to seek God's mercy and forgiveness. He thought that he'd already arrived. In contrast, the tax collector was so aware of his sin. He was so ashamed that he hid in the corner of the temple and couldn't even look up. He beat his breasts. That's a sign of mourning, even today in the Middle East. And he called on God's mercy. He was completely humbled. And the story doesn't go on to tell us what happened there in the temple between God and the tax collector, but evidently something did because he was the one who went home justified. And I wonder what those listening to Jesus made of it. What do we make of it? Well, God's word is just as relevant for us today as it was to Jesus' listeners back in 30 AD. Who are the Pharisees today? Religious leaders who think they have all sewn up, present company accepted. Church leaders who place heavy burdens on their flocks. Christian writers who make it all sound so easy. Those who add to the simple gospel, you must do this if you want to be a proper Christian. Who are the tax collectors? Who is it that is most despised in our society? You can use your imagination, but prostitutes, I don't know, immigrants who sneak onto lorries in Calais, sex offenders, vagrants, fraudsters, you've probably got people in your mind. Think about these two people in the temple. The Pharisee standing at the front in full view of everybody, proud of his religious works and denying his sin or his need of forgiveness. And the tax collector huddled in the corner somewhere over there, utterly aware of his sin, repentant. And it's that repentant attitude which is the key here. Because in God's kingdom, all, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's all of us here today, as well as the tax collectors of our world. In God's view, sin is sin. There is no degree of sin. No sin is worse than any other. It all separates us from God. And I often think that we're going to be very surprised who we meet when we get to heaven. And we're going to be very surprised at who's not there. You see, it's as it says in Psalm 51, in verse 17, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. And it was the tax collector in the parable who had the broken and contrite heart and on the receiving end of God's grace and mercy rather than the religious person. In this parable, God calls us to be like the tax collector. And indeed, when we first became Christians, we would have been aware of our separation from God and our need for his forgiveness. But as time goes on, we can forget, can't we? And like the Pharisee, become hypocrites, despising others for their sinfulness. And if you had to put yourself between these two individuals, who would you be closer to? In reality, most of us are somewhere in between, and we tend to move towards one side or the other, depending on what's going on in our lives. Sometimes we do think we're great, don't we? We think we've got it all sewn up with God. Everything's going great. We've got a hotline to God. We can look down on others, whether they're sinners out in our community or those in our own church who've messed up. Perhaps those who are struggling, learning, or don't know their Bibles or pray as we do. Would you be nearer the front? Pleased that you were able to put some notes in the plate during the collection and looking down to see what others are putting in raising your hands in worship and wondering why others weren't so close to God as you, looking forward to telling your home group how to be a wonderful Christian like you are and counting up the hours that you are spending reading your Bible or serving on some committee. Or would you be huddled in the corner wondering why you are here at all, thinking how could anyone love someone like you, ashamed of the things you have done? Perhaps there's no great sin in your life, but you're aware that you hardly ever look at your Bible, In fact, you're an absolutely rubbish Christian, if you're even a Christian at all. And the good news for you is that Jesus said, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. 
And can we say, like Paul in 1 Timothy 1, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Paul even then said, I am the worst. Not I was the worst, I am the worst. How do people outside our church view us? Do they see the Pharisee pontificating about all the things they've done for God? Or do they see a church that welcomes sinners, whatever they've done? I once had a little card that said, Jesus accepts you exactly as you are and then gently invites you to change. And that's a lovely pattern for a church to adopt, isn't it? Accepting people, whatever they have done, and gently inviting them to change. As a church, shouldn't we be coming alongside those who are aware that they have sinned, helping them to know God's grace and his and our forgiveness? It's a challenge, isn't it? It certainly challenged me and made me look at my attitudes. That's what Christian growth is all about, recognizing those things that need attention, knowing that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and asking the Holy Spirit to change our hearts and minds so that we become more like Jesus. So the next time that we're tempted to think that we've got it all sorted, I hope that you and I will remember this parable, that it was the absolutely despised but repentant tax collector who found favor with God. Amen.